We would like to extend a very warm and hearty welcome to everyone this evening. We have a very fine program prepared. It's chock full of spiritual food. We look forward to it. And to get started, we'd like to invite all that are able to stand and we'll join in singing song number 14. As mentioned, we have a very fine meeting prepared this evening. Our, our assigned Bible reading this week for, uh, from the book of Genesis, chapters 12 through 14. And you no doubt noticed it's packed full of uh, information. And so we look forward to covering some of that in some of your comments, as well as a couple of questions we'll consider in digging from spiritual gems. We're going to open with a, a, a part entitled, A Covenant That Affects You. What covenant is that, and how does it affect us? We look forward to that. Brother Webb's going to handle that. And then in Digging from Spiritual Gems, Digging for Spiritual Gems, we'll consider some of your comments on the research on those verses. And we're going to look at two questions. How can we imitate Abraham when resolving disputes? And how did Levi pay tithes through Abraham? So we look forward to that. In our Bible reading this evening, we're going to uh, welcome Gavin Dragon to, our, to do his first reading. We look forward to that. Then we have a, a discussion about uh, apply yourself to reading and teaching. We're going to see a video. And Brother Lee's going to handle what can you learn from the original songs? Uh, if you've already watched that video, you'll no doubt enjoy that. And then we'll have a local needs part and our congregation Bible study. So we look forward to that. Without further ado, let's turn our attention to Brother Webb. A covenant that affects you. A covenant that affects you. We know that there, uh, as Jehovah's people, when Jehovah gives a promise. It's something that we definitely can uh, be sure of. Uh, but this covenant ac actually affects each and every one of us here today. So let us turn to the Bible. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2. I invite you to turn there with me. And we'll see this promise that Jehovah made to Abraham. 
So Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2. And there it says, And Jehovah said to Abram, Go out from your land and away from your relatives and from the house of your father to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will become a blessing. Well, when did this covenant go into effect? Well, this covenant with Abraham went into effect when Abraham crossed the Euphrates River on his way to Canaan. Well, how do we know this? Why is this so important for us? Well, at the end of the 430 years of living in Egypt and in the land of Canaan, on this very day, Israel, who had been in slavery in Egypt, went out, as it were. They were delivered when? from Egypt. Well, in Nisan 14, 1513 BCE, which coincided with the Passover. This would indicate that Abraham crossed the Euphrates River on his way to Canaan, Canaan rather, on Nisan 14, 1943 BCE. Evidently, that is when the Abrahamic covenant took effect. Well, Jehovah enlarged this promise, saying, To your seed I'm going to give to you this land. And certainly this shows a connection between his covenant with the promise in Eden, thus revealing the seed would take a human course. And we know that it would run through a human line of descent. But how would we benefit? How would you and I benefit? Well, I encourage you now to turn with me, please, to Genesis chapter 12 and verse 13. Let's read that together. That's Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. It says, All the families of the ground will certainly be blessed by the means of Abraham. Well, like how the, the watchtower brings it out, it says it's a staggering promise. Well, why so? Why is it a staggering promise? Well, to fulfill this promise, Jehovah will resurrect from the dead representatives of families that have died. So if we can even personalize it, because remember, how does this covenant affect us? When we think about the resurrection hope, isn't that something that you and I look forward to, friends? Certainly. Welcoming back our dead loved ones. So this will be a resurrection or resurrected to a situation, not as we see on the earth today, but as been brought out in the watchtower, it's resembled the paradise that was lost by Adam and Eve and something that we certainly look forward to. Now, if you turn with me, please, to Genesis chapter 13 and verse 14 through 17, we will now delve into the point Jehovah, how Jehovah showed Abraham the land that his offering would, offspring would possess. So let's read that together. Genesis chapter 13 and verse 14 through 17. And there it says, Jehovah said to Abram, after Lot, Lot had separated from him, raise your eyes, please, and look from the place where you are to the north and, and the south, east and west. Because all the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring as a lasting possession. And I will make your offspring like the dust particles of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust particles of the earth, then your offspring could be counted. Get up, travel through the length and breadth of the land, for to you I'm going to give it. Certainly a lot of uh, information there for us to, to really meditate on. Well, on this basis, this related historical evidence, some scholars believe that in transferring land to a buyer, when you would show the buyer the land itself, 
when the buyer said, I see, it was like a legal, legally binding because he's physically seeing the land. Well, Jehovah gave Abraham the promise of receiving the land of Canaan, perhaps because Jehovah said he would give the promised land to Abraham's seed later on. Now, Abraham did not say, I see. Because if he had said he saw, this would be legally binding. He would be thinking about himself. But this was a promise made to, to um, his seed, something to, to be inherited in the future. Our workbook tonight, I want to encourage you to take a look at that at our workbook. There are a few points there that, in summary, for us to really meditate on. How this covenant affects us. Jehovah made a covenant with Abraham which formed the legal foundation of the kingdom of the heavens. And the covenant apparently went into, into, into an effect in 1943 BCE when Abraham crossed the Euphrates River on his way to Canaan. And thirdly, the covenant remains in, in effect until the messianic kingdom destroys God's enemies and brings blessings to all the families of the earth. So there are blessings that we can enjoy today by being able to enjoy the, the covenant in the sense that uh, when we think about Jesus Christ and the blessings that um, uh, the lineage through Christ, how we're benefiting from that today, but also future. When we think about um, the resurrection hope, that we can enjoy, we can see our young, our dead loved ones uh, resurrected on a paradise earth. And you and I will have the opportunity uh, to be able to teach them when they're resurrected about um, Jehovah's, uh, the hope for a longer um, future for them when, once they're resurrected. And we look forward to a time where we can actually teach these ones. Uh, that's something for us to really work forward so we can be there to enjoy that. So in, so in ending, there's a, a thought and a question that's posed for us in the workbook. It says, Jehovah bless Abraham for his great faith. If we demonstrate faith in Jehovah's promises, what blessings await us as a result of the Abrahamic covenant? Thank you, Brother Webb. How nice it is, how wonderful it is, really, that a covenant made so long ago with Abraham continues today uh, to give us hope as we look to the future. Well, we look forward to some of your comments in your research this week. We're going to turn our attention to Brother Lurch as he handles for us digging for spiritual gems. We got some nice principles set out for us here uh, in our Bible reading this week in chapters 12 through 14. And these brothers back then uh, really set a fine example for us as uh, Christians today. So uh, to get started with uh, digging into this in Genesis uh, 13, 8 and 9, who would like to read that for us? Sister Gray? So Abram said to Lot, Please, there should be no quarreling between me and you, and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land available to you? Please separate from me. If you go to the left, then I will go to the right. But if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. What a nice demeanor here uh, from our dear brother. But let's go ahead and take a look at the question. How can we imitate Abraham? when resolving disputes. What can we say about that? Sister Rogers? So we can follow Abraham's example by in, being eager to eliminate tensions that might arise. Like in his situation um, with Abraham and Lot, the herdsmen were quarreling among each other about the grazing of the land, so they had to separate into different lands so the peace would um, be with them. Very good. And Brother Leith. It 
it is noteworthy that Abraham was Lot's uncle, and he had first choice. But I like how the faithful slave put it here. He said, Abraham sought peace, not his own interests. So not because he had the right. That was not what he was interested in. He was interested in peace and unity. And when we have a problem with our brothers and we go to them, we should not look for our own rights. See if we can have peace with our brothers so that unity can remain. Very good. Sister West. And we can see how Jehovah felt about his um, attitude because he promised Abraham great blessings after this. So the same applies to us when we seek out others. In, we put others' interests ahead of ours in order to keep the peace with our brothers and sisters. Even if for a while it may seem like we gave up on something or, or whatever it was, Jehovah always blesses us for making the right choice. And the right choice is always to keep peace with our brothers and sisters. Very good. What a blessing. Brother uh, Medina. So a lesson that we can learn from this is the last sentence in that watchtower comment that Jehovah is never going to allow his servants to suffer la lasting loss if we act in harmony with divine principles and we settle differences in the spirit of love and peace. So it's something for us to look at. Don't worry about what we might lose. If we do things the right way according to Jehovah, we're going to receive blessings for that. Very good. So uh, God's servants peaceably resolve potentially divisive issues, don't we? And that's a nice lesson we can all learn. How about our next uh, um, scripture there uh, in Genesis 14, 18 through 20? Who would like to read that for us, please? Brother Cam and Drum. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of Most High God. Then he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, Ab Ab Abraham by the Most High God, <coughs> maker of heaven and earth. And praised be the Most High God, who has handed your oppressors over to you. And Abram gave him, gave him a tenth of everything. Okay. So here we have a nice question about uh, Levi. How did Levi pay tithes through Abraham? Interesting point. How did that happen? I have the sister there in the in the back. Sister Finch, got you now. You can see through the glare. Okay, it's brought out at e Hebrews 7, 9. It says that Levi paid tithes through Abraham because he was still a future descendant of his forefather Abraham when he met M Melchizedek. So in effect, he paid tithes to Melchizedek through, his, through Abraham. Interesting point, wasn't it? Very interesting for us to think about that, how that, how that was paid uh, through Abraham. So we have a couple more questions here, okay? What spiritual gems from this week's Bible reading have you sh would like to share regarding Jehovah? This is the first one. Sister Lurch. The whole account in Genesis 13, 7 through 13 about Abraham telling Lot he could have the first choice. Lot's eyes went to the well-watered region that was like to him, he said, the Garden of Eden. But it really must have seemed to be the perfect place to settle his, his family. But the first appearances were really not what he should have made his decision on. What had looked so good to Lot turned out to be a cause of trouble for his family. And when we face decisions, we have to be alert to the dangers and guard against anything that would deceive us by first impression. Good. Thank you, Sister Lurch. How about in the field ministry this week? Yeah, a little sister here. She's got a nice comment for us. Don't fight, make peace. Okay, don't fight, make peace. Very good. Do you do that with your brother? <laughs> okay, no. <laughs> All right. Or something else. What can, what can we say? Uh, brother Grubb. Hmm. 
Well, I thought it was interesting the Bible speaks about how beautiful um, Sarah was. And when they were going to Egypt, Abraham knew this, of course, and he knew that the Egyptian men would be wanting to take uh, Sarah. And in doing so, they would kill Abraham. So Abraham told Sarah to tell the Egyptians that she was his sister. So mm -hmm. people would read that and think that Abraham was wanting Sarah to tell a lie. But if we go a little further to Genesis 20:12, it talks about how Abraham and Sarah had both had the same father. So they were half brother and half sister and she wasn't telling a lie. So it shows how we don't want to take one scripture out of context and build a doctrine around it. Very nice, thank you. Well, we'll turn our meeting back over to our chairman. Thank you, Brother Lurch. And thank all of you for your fine comments and obvious preparation, we appreciate that. Well, we're gonna turn our attention now to uh, Gavin Dragon. He's going to handle our Bible reading this evening. It's taken from Genesis chapter 12, and he's going to read for us verses 1 through 20. And Jehovah said to Abram, Go out from your land and away from your relatives and from the house of your father to the land that I will sh show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will become a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who calls them evil on you. And all the families of the ground will certainly be blessed by means of you. So Abram went just as Jehovah had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and Lot, the son of his brother, and all the goods that they have accumulated, and the people whom they have acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. When they reached the land of Canaan, they traveled through the land as far as the site of Shechem, near the big trees of Maring. At the time, the Canaanites were in the land. Jehovah then appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I am going to give this land. So he built an altar there to Jehovah, and who had appeared to him. Later he moved from the mountainous regions east of Bethel and pinched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to Jehovah and began praising on the name of Jehovah. Afterwards, Abram broke camp and journeyed towards the Negev, moving his camp one place to another. Now a famine rose in the land, and Abram, and Abram traveled uh, to, towards, down towards Egypt to reside there for a while. Because the famine in the land was severe, as he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, Please listen, I know what a beautiful woman you are. So when the Egyptians see you, they will certainly say, This is his wife. Then they will kill me, but keep you alive. Please say that you are my sister, so that, I'll, so that it may go well with me because of you, and my life will be spared. As soon as Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians noticed that the woman was very beautiful. And the princes of Pharaoh also saw her and they began praising her to Pharaoh. So the woman was taken to the house of Pharaoh. He, treat, he treated Abram well because of her, and he, and, Abram, and he acquired sheep, cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female, don male and female servants, and camel. Then Jehovah struck Pharaoh and his household with severe plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did not you not tell me she, that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister, so that I was about to take her as my wife? 
Here is your wife. Take her and go. So Pharaoh gave his men's orders concerning him. And they, and they, and they set him away with his wife and all that he had. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you so much. You sure that was your first time? That was very, very nice. We appreciated that. You know, we were looking uh, at uh, study number 10. Um, and, you know, when somebody gives their first talk, we're not really looking for perfection. Well, we're never looking for perfection because none of us are there. But you did a really nice job. I noticed, for example, um, in, in study 10 there, it's, it talks about modulation. And it talks about how we need to convey ideas very clearly. And when, so when we're reading, we need to be able to read very clearly and distinctly. You did a nice job of that. It also uh, encourages us to vary our volume based on the uh, content that we're reading and uh, in order to highlight a main point. And you did that actually a couple times in verse 1 when you said, go out from the land. And also in verse 10, when you, when you read, now a famine came upon the land. And so you did a nice job with that. And uh, we were also encouraged to vary our pace. You did that in verse 11. And then uh, uh, that's just one example. You did it a number of times, but I just picked out a few examples. And uh, varying pitch and pace. So uh, you did a very nice job. And so we look forward to your next reading. Very nice. Well, with that, we're going to move into the next section of our uh, meeting, our Apply Yourself to the Field Ministry. And to begin with that section, we're going to take a look at um, a video, and we're going to entitle it Apply Yourself to Reading and Teaching. And then we're going to discuss that video in that uh, conversation point number 14. At Hebrews 8.1, the Apostle Paul wrote, Now this is the main point of what we are saying. When we teach, we want our main points to stand out. Why? Well, which is easier to listen to? A rambling discourse that outlines seemingly unrelated facts? Or an organized presentation with main points that relate to the theme? When we make our main points stand out, we help our audience to pay attention, understand, and remember what we say. So how can you make the main points stand out? First, decide on the objective of your talk. Aim to accomplish something. If you don't know your objective, neither will your audience. Do you want to inform, convince, encourage, motivate, or something else. For example, let's say that you're discussing the resurrection. If you're speaking to a grieving family made up of fellow Christians, your objective may be to give encouragement and comfort. On the other hand, if you're speaking about the resurrection to unbelieving relatives who have questioned your beliefs, your objective might be to convince them. In each instance, the main points you choose will be different because the objective is different. So when preparing, select only main points that help you achieve your objective and that you can teach effectively in the allotted time. Then develop the points in a logical order. Ask yourself, what questions or objections might my audience have about this topic? In what logical order? Would they raise those questions or objections? Often, however, we are given an outline to develop, and the main points have already been selected and put in a certain order. In such a case, analyze the outline to have clearly in mind the objective of the talk and how the main points will help you to reach that objective. 
as you give the talk, you don't want the audience to lose sight of your theme. So at various times during your discourse, repeat key words in the theme or use synonyms. Your audience will remember only a few main points, so don't develop too many. Even if you're giving a longer talk, focus on developing a few points well. As you develop secondary points, explain their connection to the main point. Don't add ideas just because they're interesting. To make your main points stand out, you might repeat in a sentence or two each main point before going on to the next. Or you might state the main points in the introduction and then restate them in the conclusion. When you finish, the audience should be able to remember the main points. Let's watch a brother who's in the middle of giving a talk. See if you can discern the main point he's developing and his theme. Let's turn to Proverbs 28.1. Here, the righteous are compared to a very impressive animal. The wicked flee when no one pursues them, but the righteous are as confident as a lion. You and I can be like a lion. Imagine that. Bible writers were familiar with lions because they were once plentiful in Israel, although they are now extinct there. A lion's thunderous roar can be heard for miles. They can move at a speed of 40 miles per hour. They are so powerful that a single blow from a lion's paw is enough to break the neck of a small antelope. According to insight on the scriptures, the lion serves as a fitting symbol of courageous justice. And so Jesus is called the lion that is of the tribe of Judah. Could you tell from that talk what the theme is? Is it something about lions? Jesus? The righteous? Actually, the theme of this talk is Jehovah makes us bold. What's the main point that the speaker was trying to develop? Jehovah is the source of true boldness. Let's watch the speaker try again. This time, notice how he emphasizes the theme and main point. Let's turn to Proverbs 28.1. As we read this verse, look for the answer to this question. What sort of people can be truly confident? The wicked flee when no one pursues them, but the righteous are as confident as a lion. So, who can be confident? The righteous. And who are the righteous? Those who have faith in the ransom and who strive to adhere to Jehovah's requirements. Here's the point. Confidence comes not from natural ability, education, or riches. The source of true boldness is our relationship with Jehovah. So when we go in the ministry, we don't need to be afraid. We're doing what Jehovah requires, and Jehovah is supporting us. Remembering this will help us to preach with boldness. This time, the speaker introduced the scripture in a way that called attention to the main point. He avoided cluttering his talk with details that didn't support his point. And to make sure the audience got the main point, he told them, here's the point. Then he connected the point to the theme. Whether from the platform or in the ministry, our teaching should be simple and clear. If we group our thoughts under just a few main points that relate to our objective and theme, our presentation will be easy to follow and hard to forget. Very nice. So as we think about that video, as well as the study point 14, the information that we have there, um, who can summarize for us first of all summarize for us why it's important to that the main main points are made to stand out why is that important brother green
Well, I like the comparison between how the first portion showed that the brother was rambling and speaking on unrelated terms, and how the secondary came out to where he focused on the point. Uh, reminds me of what I do for work, which is if I have to explain something, I don't want to give them too much ancillary information about why things work. I just want to isolate, well, this is the root cause of the problem. This is how we can avoid the problem moving forward. And by the way, did you get the point of what this all was about and repeat it back to me? So uh, we can use this same type of approach with uh, those whom we meet and we have conversations with. We don't want to give them too much information because the brain can only hold so much. We just want to focus on the main points and ensure that the people that we do meet do get the point of the message. Very nice. Uh, Gavin? Uh, it's also because you want to uh, give give the person information and they want to know what and give them what to give them to know that what it is about what like what's the sh like what's the like what's uh, in it like what like what like where it is yeah exactly <laughs> like like i mean really like exactly seriously <laughs> But that is exactly right. That's what we're trying to do. Um, so just maybe summarize for us, how, how do we do that? Uh, one of the things that brought out in the video was to have an objective. Uh, what, what, what does that mean? How do we do that? Uh, Sister West? We need to figure out what the purpose is of what we're saying. Um, I think it said, are we trying to inform, convince, motivate, or encourage? Because it can be the same topic, um, I use the example of resurrection, but depending on who we're talking to, who our audience is, if we're talking to someone who recently lost someone who is familiar with the resur resurrection hope, then we're there to encourage. But if we're talking to someone who isn't, maybe it's more informative. Um, so if we don't know what that objective is, the person we're talking to isn't really going to know the point of what we're saying. So we have to have that clear ahead of time. And what would be the correlation between the main points and what our objective is. It was brought out in that video as well as uh, Sister Rivera. The importance of bringing out the main points is because that's how you're going to achieve your objective. Right. And did you notice the point that the main points could be different depending on what the objective was? So you might pull different information out based on your objective. And then um, finally, emphasizing the theme of, your, of the talk, uh, what was brought out in the video as to why that's important? And how, how can we do that? Sister Lurch? Well, our brains get easily sidetracked. And so if there's all these different points, we might forget what the main point of the talk is. So the speaker has the the um the job of either bringing it out in the beginning and in the conclusion maybe referring to it slightly throughout the talk or after each main point repeat that main point in a sentence or two so that it's clear to the audience okay very nice now i'm sure um brother j Sal west feels very comfortable now with the fact that uh he's going to consider a talk and he's going to be working on that very point number 14 and the theme is what made sarah so precious No pressure. <laughs> Sarah was mentioned by name several times in the Bible as an example. So it must be that Jehovah really wants us to learn about her example and that she was very precious to him. But what, what was it about Sarah that was so precious in Jehovah's eyes? Well, in tonight's Bible reading, we learn one aspect about her is that she was very physically beautiful. Was that it? Well, who in the one that's talked about in the Bible was focusing on her beauty? Was it Sarah? No, she didn't mention anything about herself that way, being humble. Was it Jehovah? No, it was Pharaoh and the princes, worldly men, that was focusing on her beauty. So, it wasn't that. What was it that was important? Well, we didn't 
learn a lot about about Sarah, but a couple things we learn about is when it talks about in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, all it mentions was that Abraham went out as Jehovah had directed him to the land that he was going to show him, and obviously Sarah went with him. But if we think a little bit about the details, we can see well, what was Sarah doing with all that? We know that she was over 60 years old when she agreed to go with him. She left a house, probably with indoor plumbing that they had. She had to live in tents for the rest of her life, traveling over 1,000 to 2,000 miles throughout her life. She had to leave behind her friends. She had to probably pack up her belongings, probably sell most of which wasn't travel ready. And then Abraham's elderly father came along, may have had special needs. In fact, he died along the way. He was uh, in elderly condition. So she was very industrious and respectful in, in that she really made sure that decision of Abraham's worked when they agreed to it. But when she went along with it, did she just do it begrudgingly? But was it really agreeable with it? Maybe it after a while, she made Abraham know, well, I'll do this, but I'm not happy. Do you think that was her attitude? Let's turn to a scripture in 1 Peter chapter 3. And here we learn about some more details about Sarah that Jehovah had inspiration written about her. In 1 Peter chapter 3, let's look at verse 3. It says, Do not let your adornment be external, the braiding of the hair and the wearing of gold ornaments or fine clothing. But let it be the secret person of the heart in the incorruptible adornment of the quiet and mild spirit, which is of great value in the eyes of God. For this is how the holy women of the past who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, subjecting themselves to their husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham. So we know that Sarah didn't pick or focused on the external beauty, which is fades very quickly. But no, it was an internal beauty that she focused on. She worked hard for many years, focusing on uh, in respect the decision that had been made to work along with that. And it showed how important it was to her to do so, along with Jehovah's direction. But in all this, was Sarah maybe a mousy wife, just quiet? No, in fact, if we go further in a few chapters in Genesis, when there was a situation with Hagar, she spoke her mind about the decision. And so much so that Abraham allowed her to handle that situation in the household. So we can tell she was one of dynamic, one that uh, both respectful, but was not mousy. There was a quote here in the material that really sums up the material. It says, uh, from a sister named Jill, it says, Sarah's example has taught me that I should feel free to speak up and express my viewpoint to my husband. At the same time, as head of the family, my husband has a responsibility to make the final decision. Once he has done so, it is my job to do whatever I can to make that decision work. Yes, so... Sarah was precious to Jehovah as a good example for us, not adorning ourselves externally, but with heartfelt respect, humility, and loving support in Jehovah's arrangement. Thank you, Brother West. We appreciate that uh, you handling that for us this evening. Um, you were working on study number... Uh, 14 and uh, we appreciated how you did that um, as we've already discussed several of the, the the points out of that information one is that we need to help our audience follow along with the talk by the way we choose the main points and have it follow the theme and you did that very well uh, it was very easy to follow very logical um, it, it also brought out that we only want to select the main points that we can cover only a few main points that we can cover in the time that we have and so in this case it's it's a rather short talk so you can only pick so many points and so we appreciated that 
Uh, the other thing was it mentions that we, we should emphasize the theme, maybe mention it several times through the talk. You probably could have mentioned it a couple more times. You did do in the introduction and, and in the conclusion and, and once during the body. But just by saying something like, um, now does that really show why Sarah was so precious? And another point is, you know what I mean? And so that's, you might have been able to do that a couple more times, but you did an excellent job. Excellent job, and we really appreciate that. Thank you. Now we're going to move into uh, our next segment of the meeting, Living as Christians. And in order to do that, we'd like to invite everyone to stand if they can. And we're join, going to join in singing song number 144. It's based on 2 Corinthians 4.18. Keep your eyes on the prize. That's song number 144. Now we'd like to turn our attention to Brother Edwin Leith. He's going to handle the topic for us. What can you learn from the original songs? Original songs. Do you have a favorite original song? And why do you have a favorite? Does it appeal to you? Does it encourage you? Well, how does the video contents relate to your everyday life? These are some of the things that we are going to be discussing. And with such variety, we know that something is going to appeal to you. It's going to be a source of encouragement to you. For instance, myself, I like the original song, Jehovah is always by my side. Because it encourages me, it strengthens me, and I play it also for my wife to strengthen her. Some people believe that sometimes it's just for entertainment, but nevertheless, the original songs and music video are more than just entertainment. Why? They're there for a purpose. Each original song teaches practical lessons that we can apply in our Christian life and ministry, because there are some that deal with the ministry. As some that deal with the situation that we are experiencing. And so therefore it can be a great help to us. Some songs focus on hospitality, unity, friendship, courage, love, or faith. Others deal with returning to Jehovah, showing forgiveness, maintaining daily integrity, and pursuing spiritual goals. These points that I just mentioned affects our relationship with Jehovah. 
And naturally, these songs are able to do just that. But what other practical lessons have you learned from original songs? Well, this is a discussion and we're going to have a video just around the corner. So watch as you see and enjoy the video. So we have some questions for you after watching that video. What future blessing is the older couple thinking about? And if you'd like to bring in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. Sister Lurch. Genesis 12, 3 brings out that all the families of the ground will certainly be blessed by means of you. And so this couple are looking to being blessed by having the resurrection of their daughter. Yes, thank you. Sister Jana Sood. And as they were thinking ahead, they uh, were thinking of themselves young, which is another promise that Jehovah has given to, to restore us to our youth. Thank you. And Sister Milo. I was thinking it's similar to Sister Sue because at the end you saw her in a wheelchair, but before that you saw her pretty much running everywhere, um, which is something that she wasn't able to do at that time when the both of them are thinking about what the promised paradise will be like when they welcome their daughter back. Very nice, very nice. Next question. How do we strengthen our faith in Jehovah's ability to fulfill his promises? How do we do that? Brother Rodriguez. 
Chris. One way we can accomplish this is by reading and meditating on Jehovah's promises for the future and really taking the time to imagine ourselves there, um, see what it would be like with our friends and our family and what we're looking forward to in particular. Thank you. I'm Brother Lurch. Really appreciate there too, uh, along with the song. It pictures, you can see the pictures. So you picture yourself in that video. And that's the best part about, that's one of my favorite songs, like you were saying uh, about favorite songs. But you can see and picture those things in your own mind's eye while the song is going on. Yes, thank you. And Brother Dragon, Patrick. And as we imagine it ourselves there, we could uh, share it with each other. Our conversation can reflect what we really are looking forward to, what it will be like, what we imagine things will be like the first day, the first week, and welcoming loved ones back. And that's something that we can get to know each other as we're getting to be closer as brothers and sisters. Yes. And young brother Dragon, Gavin. Like, like, like he... He sa said, uh, "We we get to uh, we get to um, we get to imagine wh uh, what it could uh, what it could be like." Yes, and we want to bear in mind scriptures like Titus one and verse two, saying, "The basis of a hope of everlasting life, which God promised, who cannot lie." We have confidence in Jehovah. What happy reunions are just around the corner? What are those happy reunions? Brother West. Well, maybe we've lost a loved one. Like in the video, it seemed like their daughter had passed away and they were imagining meeting her in the paradise so we can look forward to if we've ever lost a friend or a loved one, meeting them again in the paradise. Very good. And Brother Bell. And I really like how this uh, question is worded, even towards the end, just around the corner. Um, that, that's kind of representing that it's near, and that's something that we can look up, look, um, have hope in, instead of something that's really far away, that this is, this is real, and Jehovah will provide, and this is around the corner, and we can look forward to our loved ones uh, to see again. Thank you, and final question. How does the kingdom hope help us to endure trials? If you want to bring in Romans chapter 8 and verse 25. Sister Rivera. The scripture says, But if we hope for what we do not see, we keep eagerly waiting for it with endurance. And so when we have hope and we have that light at the end of the tunnel, then no matter what comes our way, we'll keep pushing forward and we'll keep enduring because we know it's true. As you mentioned um, in Titus 1-2, God cannot lie. And so what he has promised will come to be. Yes. And um, there's a suggestion here for family worship. He said, watch the original song videos and then answer these two questions. What particular lesson does the video teach? How can I apply them in our personal life? And the list here, do not be afraid. Forgive one another. Follow the course of hospitality to keep the peace. I look at all those videos and they are very interesting and very encouraging. So make it a point to have a family study. So, in conclusion, original songs strengthen our relationship with Jehovah. They build hope and unity and strengthen our relationship with Jehovah. Back to the chairman. Thank you, Brother Leith. Was that a marvelous video? And no doubt all of us agree because we've probably experienced it, that those original songs really do uh, encourage us, motivate us, strengthen our relationship with Jehovah God. This evening, our uh, local needs is going to uh, be handled under the title, Continue Developing the Mind of Christ. Now, it would take a lot more than five minutes to talk about this topic in all of its facets. 
But this evening we're going to speak about this specifically on how it relates to how we study each week the information for our Bible study out of the publication, Jesus, the Way, the Truth, and the Life. If you recall, Paul discusses in Ephesians chapter 4 that the world is in, men is in darkness mentally. And uh, we, that's the world that we have come out of. And that we still have to touch because we have to go out into it uh, in our daily lives. And then in Romans chapter 12, he highlights for us how critical it is that we become transformed. How? By making our minds over. And so it's critical that we undergo that transformation. So in making our minds over, what's the objective? Well, if you would, join with me. And we're going to take a look in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In verse number 16, notice the thought, For who has come to know the mind of Jehovah, so that he may instruct him? Uh, but we do have uh, the mind of Christ. And so we need to continue to develop that. So what does developing the mind of Christ involve? Well, in the 1986 Watchtower of December 1st, it made this comment. It said that we need to acquire, quote, a deep understanding of the life and teachings of the Son, Jesus Christ. This is a continuous process. So you can see how the study of this publication each week gives us a perfect opportunity to do just that if we meditate on that information. When we meditate on each chapter that we study each week and thinking about how it applies to us, how we can be like Jesus Christ, what are the qualities he has? How does he think? How does he react? And when we make that application to ourselves, we begin to, or we continue to develop that mind of Christ that we've already been developing. Oh, we can study the information and be able to come to the meeting and answer the questions. Uh, and that's very important. The knowledge is very important, so we don't want to minimize that. Uh, some might even be able to come to the meeting unprepared, just listen to the reading, and be able to answer all the questions that the moderator asks. But that's informational. The only place we can meditate and apply that is not here. It's when we prepare before we come here. And so when we do that, we can continue to develop the same qualities and the same attitudes that Jesus Christ had. For example, what have we seen in this publication so far? And we have a number of chapters yet to go. We've seen that Jesus is very bold and courageous. He's a man of action uh, for Jehovah God. We've seen how he reacts to children. Very tender, very loving. He considers them very important. We see how he has dealt and with women. Very respectful. He holds them in a very high regard. We've seen how he has dealt with his apostles. We've seen how compassionate and loving he is. He was a perfect example of humility. And again, he was a courageous servant of Jehovah. So with such fine examples, is it any wonder that the apostles were faithful followers of Christ for all of those years. Think about the example of Peter. As we study his example, we could have picked any example, but think of Peter in his early years following Jesus Christ. Remember how impetuous and he was and um, how immature he was. And yet as we study over time, we can see how he developed the mind of Christ and he changed over that period of time. And so we can likewise do the same if we meditate on this information each week in the vein of, of developing, continuing to develop the mind of Christ and have his attitude, his way of thinking, and do things the way Jesus Christ did. So we look forward to how we might do that moving forward. So with that, we're going to turn our attention to Brother Mike Cheney. He's going to handle for us the Congregation Bible Study.
we can all turn in our Jesus the Way publication or on our tablets or devices. We're going to be uh, looking at an account with the title, The King Enters Jerusalem on a Colt. An important account because if you notice, we had uh, four different renditions of, of what took place. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, so we'll use those references too as we go through that. So we'll go ahead and have it, it read. Uh, Brother Hardage is going to read for us uh, this evening, and then we'll get to our questions. The next day, Sunday, nights and nine, Jesus leaves Bethany with his disciples and heads to Jerusalem. As they approach Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus tells two of his disciples, go into the village that is within sight, and you will at once find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If someone says anything to you, you must say, the Lord needs them. At that, he will immediately send them. The disciples fail to see that Jesus' instructions involve Bible prophecy. Later, however, they grasp the fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy. He foretold, foretold that God's promised king would come into Jerusalem, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a female donkey. When the disciples come to Bethpage and take the male colt and its mother, People standing nearby ask, what are you doing untying that colt? But uh, when they hear that the animals are for the Lord, they let the disciples bring them to Jesus. The disciples place their outer garments on the donkey and on its offspring, but Jesus mounts the colt. The crowd increases as Jesus rides toward Jerusalem. And many spread their garments on the road. Others cut branches from the trees of the foliage from the fields and spread them out. They cry, save we pray, blessed is the one who comes in Jehovah's name. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Pharisees in the crowd are upset over these proclamations. They tell Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus replies, I tell you, if these remain silent, the stones would cry out. As Jesus views Jerusalem, he begins to weep and says, if you, even you, had discerned on this day the things having to do with peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. Jerusalem will pay the price for willful disobedience. Jesus foretells, your enemies will build around you a fortification of pointed stakes and will encircle you and besiege you from every side. They will dash you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave a stone upon a stone in you. True to Jesus' words, Jerusalem's destruction comes in the year 70 CE. When Jesus enters Jerusalem, the whole city is in an uproar, saying, Who is this? And the crowds keep saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Those in the crowd who had seen Jesus resurrect Lazarus, tell others about that miracle. The Pharisees lament that they are getting absolutely nowhere. They say to one another, the whole world has gone after him. As is this his custom when visiting Jerusalem, Jesus goes to the temple to teach. There he cures the blind and lame. When the chief priests and the scribes see what he is doing, and hear the boys in the temple cry out, Save, we pray, the son of David. They become angry. The religious leaders ask Jesus, Do you hear what these are saying? He replies, Did you never read this? Out of the mouth of children and infants, you have brought forth praise. Jesus looks around and upon the things in the temple. It is now late, so he leaves with the apostles. Uh, before nice and ten begins, he travels back to Bethany, where he spends Sunday night. Thank you, Brother Hardage. So our first question, when and in what manner does Jesus enter Jerusalem as king? Sister Gray. He enters the city on Sunday nights on the 9th. And the way he does this is he rides on a colt, 
a colt that belongs to a, 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 a adult donkey, but this is the young one. And he rides in on this colt, just like it's prophesied in Zechariah, where he's going to come in as king, humble, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a female donkey. Okay, thank you. Maybe we could bring up the picture so we can see that. What do you see in the faces of those that are watching this? Or what would be your reaction if you were there? Sister Lurch? You just see complete joy in their hearts because these people, as, as normal, common people, the Pharisees think they don't know anything, but obviously they know the scriptures because of the things they say about Jesus. They, am I getting into the other one? No. It says, um, they said, say if we pray, blessed is the one who comes in Jehovah's name. So they recognize who he is. They're happy. They're, they know things are going to eventually get better. Okay, good. Sister Euling? And also when we look at that picture, we see how that um, they have taken their outer garments off and they're spreading them for, for on his way. And also they have cut down... Um, the uh, branches from the, around the trees. Okay, yeah, I see that too. How about uh, Luke nineteen forty one? We know we had a, a little bit of reference material there, but how did Jesus feel, and how did he display that? Maybe you caught that point. Sister Sood. Well, what the people were crying out was a fulfillment of uh, Psalm 118, 26. This was a prophetic psalm. And Jesus was saying, well, even if these didn't cry out, because the Pharisees were annoyed uh, at the people. And uh, Jesus made the point to them is that, well, even if they didn't cry out, this scripture would be fulfilled because the stones would have done it. Okay, yes, true. Brother Rodriguez? Verse 41 was saying how he felt over the city. Um, he felt great pity for them, that they, that they weren't accepting, that they were willfully refusing to accept what he was saying. And he felt that because he knew the amount of lives that were involved, and he wanted them to listen and accept him as king. Yeah, we can see that in the expression in this picture, the way it's being depicted, can't we? And what about that Greek word for, for wept? What did that mean? <coughs> Sister Lurch? I thought that was interesting too because it said it often refers to weeping audibly. I had always thought in the past, you know, he was like weeping in his, his heart. It, he felt bad at heart for them. But somebody else could have heard it because that's what it referred to that he wept audibly yes very good i don't know about you but when i weep audibly i'm pretty upset something's really bothering me so that really tells us how jesus feels about humankind about man and it's nice nice artist depiction of that here okay our second question how does jesus feel when he views jerusalem and what prophecy does he utter Brothers Trimble. Of course, Jesus knows what's going to happen to uh, to them uh, in 70 CE when the Roman armies encircle them and, and eventually um, destroy the city. Um, people starve. Just horrible, horrible things take place, as we know, and that, and that was fulfilled. And Jesus knew this was going to happen. Okay, yes. So he talked about that prophecy. For the least? Jesus had tender compassion for the people, but they willfully rejected him. In fact, uh, in Matthew chapter 23, 37 and 38, he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the killer of the prophets and the stone of those sent forth. How often I tried to gather you together the way a hen gathers a chick, but you did not want your house is abandoned. And you know that house was a temple because they trusted in the temple and the temple was destroyed in 70 C because of willful disobedience. Very good. 
Yes. Brother Euling? So when we think about how he felt, he was, you know, we had already talked about how he wept. And then he also had to utter this prophecy against them. And so it's similar, you know, like when we're out in the field ministry, you know, if we feel, could feel perfectly the way Jesus did, which we can't because we're imperfect, but we would be out in the field ministry trying to contact people and weeping over the communities that, that, that won't listen because we know what's going to happen. And so as we try to develop those same qualities that Jesus had, to what degree do we feel that, re, re, you know, um, you know, I don't, I don't think very much what we went we're out in the field ministry, but do we really feel the pity for the people that won't listen? Sure. Yes, we should. Okay. What is one of the things that the crowd knows that Jesus has done that really affected them and how they viewed what was going on with him? What was one of the miracles that they had heard about? Maybe even had been around and saw firsthand what went on. Brother Dragon, back in the back. We have to remember that uh, he came from Bethany many, many times. Bethany was only two miles away where Lazarus had been resurrected. And so no doubt there was many of the individuals that were in the crowd and they, uh, the anticipation of Jesus coming into the area and uh, the, I don't want to use the word hurrah, but the uh, charismatic uh, atmosphere that was taking place, they were probably some of the individuals who were creating that. Okay, yes, very good. And with a dragon, Gavin. I also uh, also <coughs> I forgot the name. Uh, 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 I can't remember it, but. Uh, but by but it, when he, he got re, re, when Je, Jesus resurrected him. Okay. Yes, they knew about that Lazarus. Yes. Very good. Okay. All right. And our third question: What happens when Jesus goes to the temple? Sister Fenord. Well, Jesus, he went to the temple to teach, and then there he cures the, the blind and the lame. And when the chief priests and the scribes see what he is doing and they hear, they hear the voice in the temple crowd, save, we pray, they get, become angry. They become very angry. And um, they ask Jesus, do you hear what these are saying? So um, Jesus, he goes on to say to them that did you never read that, this, that out of the mouth of the children and infants you have brought forth the praise? Okay, thank you. All right, maybe get uh, your reference Bibles out and let's just look. There's a lot of scriptures here. Let's just look at a few and then see if we can look at some of the references. There's pictures and all sorts of things that you can pull from here. So who could read Matthew 21 5? Let's read that one first. And there's some nice reference on that one. Sister Gross, Maddie. Tell the... <coughs> Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you. <coughs> Mild temper and, on, and mountain, on a donkey, yes, on a colt, the offspring of a beast of burden. Okay, thank you. So what's, mean, what's meant by the daughter of Zion? We have a nice point on that, if you can look at that reference. What is meant by that? Sister Rogers. When the reference it says in the Bible, cities are often personified as women or figuratively referred to using female, I mean feminine terms. And in this expression, daughter may refer to the city itself or to the people of the city. The name Zion was closely connected with the city of Jerusalem. Yes, thank you. So without that information, that'd be hard to understand, wouldn't it? Be a little bit confusing, but 
a nice reference there. Who could read 21.9 for us, still in Matthew? Sister Dragon. Moreover, the crowds going ahead of him and those following him kept shouting, Save, we pray, the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in Jehovah's name. Save him, we pray, in the heights above. Okay, thank you. Now, this is repeated in, in many of these accounts here, of uh, different uh, Bible writers. But what does that mean, save we pray? Again, we have a nice reference there, so it's explained to us. Who can share what that means? Save we pray. Brother Medina. Basically, they're, they're saying, please grant salvation to so Hosanna. Um, the Greek term comes from a Hebrew expression that means save we pray or save please. And that's what they were shouting and that's what all of the, uh, the other Jews, the Pharisees and stuff, were all upset about. Okay, yeah, that was showing faith. Brother Milo? So one way this will actually get fulfilled, actually was fulfilled, was by um, resurrecting him from the dead. And it's interesting, this is a quotation from uh, Psalm 118, 25. And Psalm 118 was what they call one of the halal psalms, or the praise psalms. And uh, they were regularly sung around the time of the Passover. So we just have that part on music and how it, how it can influence us and encourage us and teach us lessons. Um, this was a common song around that time period. And uh, Jehovah's Spirit moved for it to be um, uttered here at this occasion and uh, really pro foretold the resurrection of Christ. Yeah, good point. Good detail. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to uh, Luke's account. Who could read Luke 1940? 1940. For the Santos. Nineteen forty says, but in reply he said, I tell you, if these remained silent, the stones would cry out. Okay. Now let's let's take this more modern day. Could Jesus, through the power given to him by Jehovah, actually make stones speak a message, do you think? Would that be possible? Maybe even today. Sister Drexel. Well, here in the reference Bible, it says that it was certain to be fulfilled on that occasion for that particular prophecy because Jehovah's word does not um, go out without a result. So if now in, in our time period, there were not people who were willing to preach the good news, then literally the stones would cry out to fulfill the prophecy of the good news being preached in all the inhabited earth. Yes, thank you. So it's possible that that, that could happen. So what does that tell us about us being given an assignment to preach, to shout out, to cry out, if it will, that Jehovah's given that to us? What do you think about that? Sister Milo? That the message is so important that he would make anything cry out, and what a privilege it is that he then uses us, because um, he could have used anything. Yeah, good. For the Hardage? And uh, um, I was thinking the same thing, that it's a privilege uh, because the reality is that Jehovah, he really, he, um, what's the word I'm looking for? He um, dignifies us uh, by making us his fellow workers, um, by allowing us to do this work and to, to carry his name to our neighbors and help them to appreciate um, his qualities. And you asked if, if it could be done, if the stones could cry. Well, we know that Jehovah spoke through a thorn brush to mm -hmm. Moses. So, you know, not quite naturally, Jehovah could make anything happen if, if he wanted to. And so it's definitely a privilege for us to be able to bear his name in the ministry. Yeah, very good. Okay. Uh, another verse in Luke. Go down to 43. Who can read 43 for us? Sister Finch, back in the back room there. I'll get you a microphone. Be 
Because the days will come upon you when your enemies will build around you a fortification of pointed stakes and will encircle you and besiege you from every side. Okay, thank you. So, again, this is the prophecy that did come true uh, that Jesus talked about. But there's nice references here really describing what, what that fortification of pointed stakes would mean. How bad would that be? Why would he weep about that and seeing what was going to happen to these people? What kind of conditions were really going to take place there? For the least? Condition in Jerusalem would be so bad that they could not escape. Because point of stakes means that if they go on top of it, they get hurt. They couldn't escape. So therefore, this point of stake tells them that condition was going to be very bad for them. If they would not listen, that is what was going to take place. And it did happen because the Romans came and they built a fortification of pointed stake around Jerusalem. And literally, Jerusalem was shut up. And f food shortage and other things happened there so that ch parents even eat some of their children for food. Okay, yes. Sister Morgan? And in looking at the gems, it showed that this uh, pointed stake or the siege wall uh, around Jerusalem held um, was for a threefold purpose. One is to prevent the Jews from fleeing, uh, two, to encourage their surrender, and also to starve the inhabitants into submission. So uh, as Brother Leith mentioned, it would be terrible condition. Thank you. Yeah. Brutal comes to my mind. A real brutal situation. Okay, let's uh, turn to another reference, another uh, Bible book. Let's go to John. And who could read uh, verse 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 14? John 12, 14. Brother Lurch. The young donkey, he sat on it, and just as it is written. Okay, so again with our references... Uh, why does it say just as it is written? What's the significance of that if you look under verse 14? And it gives us a reference there at John and also Zechariah. Brother Medina? Because that was in fulfillment of a prophecy made in Zechariah 9.9 9 where he says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Look. Your king is coming to you. He is righteous, bringing salvation. And it says, humble and riding on a donkey, mm -hmm. on a colt, the foal of a female donkey. So very specific, too, about that it would be a young donkey. Yes, very good. What's that tell us about Jesus and making sure that every one of these prophecies about him were fulfilled? What's that tell us about him? And it, maybe his relationship with Jehovah? What do you think about that? Sister Sood. We know many of the prophecies he had no control over, but uh, in this instance, we see he did, and he was so concerned with Jehovah's will and uh, things being done Jehovah's way that he did it exactly as it was written. Yes, okay. And Sister Lurch. I was thinking about his submission. Most mm -hmm. human kings wouldn't come riding in on a donkey. They'd have all this fanfare and trumpeters or whatever, mm -hmm. making sure everybody knew who they were. But Jesus came in on this young colt that hadn't been ridden before, came in a mild and humble way. And so he was submissive. I mean, he, he did everything Jehovah's way and didn't even question it. Very good. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate all the fine comments. I think we've covered the material well. Back to our chairman, Billy Ewick. Thank you, Brother Cheney. And once again, thank everyone for their fine comments. We certainly appreciate it. Wasn't that a wonderful meeting this evening full of spiritual food? We, the, those, those, chapters in Genesis 12 through 14 were so full of information and you all did a very nice job of bringing out some of those points 
a uh, very nice part of covenant that affects you. Brother Webb handled that for us. Uh, it gives us that hope as for the future, uh, as that covenant still is in effect. And the, in digging for spiritual gems, Brother Lurch handled that, and um, and our comments were really covered the information well. Both of those questions, as well as some additional comments, and those original songs. Don't we really appreciate those? and what we can learn from those. And that part this evening really helped us uh, to come to that appreciation. And then of course, how we can continue developing the mind of Christ whenever we are preparing that Bible study for uh, each week. <clears throat> so we really had a very nice program this evening. Next week on our program, uh, Brother Groff Sood is gonna be our chairman next week. The, uh, in Treasures from God's Word, we're going to talk about Jehovah renamed Abram and Sarai. Why? Brother Santos will handle that for us. Brother Joe Gonzalez is going to handle digging for spiritual gems. And then we're going to welcome another new student, uh, Gabriel Young, is going to handle our Bible reading for us next week, and we so look forward to that as well. Um, there's going to be a part of living as Christians on how couples can strengthen their marriage. Some very interesting and pertinent information there. And then, of course, our congregation Bible study. So we look forward to uh, all of those parts next week, and we thank all of the brothers and sisters for their efforts this evening. And with that, we'd like to invite all that can to stand. We're going to join in singing song number 15. It's based on Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 6. Praise Jehovah's firstborn. And Brother Omar Medina will close our meeting with prayer. That's song 15. <laughs> 